person than watching you backstage on the screen. Hey, I ain't joking around. Please be seated. You guys can sit down. Uh, John, thank you so much, man. That was such a cool intro. Hey, and how about that? Like, when God speaks for you, it don't matter how much talent you have because you can develop that. And when God spoke for me and said that I was going to get that job, come on, baby. I bring that environment everywhere I go. I ain't scared. I will say this, though. Uh, I'm just going to say it. John, thank you so much for having me. And if I looked like you, I would have never got voted off American Idol. You are freaking gorgeous. Like... When you wake up in the morning and look in the mirror, do you be like, you're darn right, this is my day. <laughs> like seriously, I'm hanging out with a bunch of bald dudes backstage and then you come in like an angel and it's like, who is this guy? It reminds me of like, like when I was little and I'd play Sega and like Nintendo and I'd build my own character of what I wanted to look like it was you. <laughs> like seriously, holy smokes. Okay, that's enough. He's gorgeous. Um, oh my God, seriously. So I, I do, honestly, I got to thank a couple people. How about your pastors, Jurgen and Leanne Matisius? Like, wow. I came here a year ago with my boy Rex Crane, first time, and I'm like, holy smokes, that's a pastor with balls. Like, can I say that? Like, for real? Is it real? And then Leanne gets on stage, and she gives a sermon about living free from offense, and I'm like, that woman is on fire, and I want my wife to be around her so my life can get better, too, because that was unbelievable. Hey, give it up for your pastors. They're unbelievable. For real. And I got to give it up for my boy, my new friend, Dr. Is anyone in here like Dr. Matt Hubbard? Okay. Okay. True story, I want to be like Dr. Matt Hubbard. I really do. Uh, we just broke ground on our first restaurant back in Clarksville, Tennessee. It's called Rock and Roll Sushi. So I'm going to be a restaurant owner like him. Uh, we have the same name. I took his name. Um, I'm an entrepreneur. Just started my own clothing brand, my own clothing line. It launched last night, bringheaven.us. What? And... I'm an entrepreneur, I'm a maverick, and I wanna be an, a maverick entrepreneur. So, and I was thinking about being a chiropractor, so I looked into it, but I'm disqualified because I don't own that much Lululemon. So, I was out. Like seriously, like dude, to own all chiropractors have like really nice Lululemon, but I disqualified myself. So, Dr. Matt, I love you. And are there any Rex and Katrina Crane fans in the house? You're my boy, Blue. True story. Rex is the reason I am here. 13 years ago, I was sitting in the back in the cheap seats. I saw him speaking in front of a few thousand people at a, a very similar business convention like this, except the people weren't as good looking and weren't as successful. But you guys are killing it. No, but seriously, I remember, true story, I was sitting in the back, and when I saw him speak, I literally said a prayer. I said, God, I need a friend like that in my life. I need somebody like that in my life. I said, God, I want it to be him, but whether it's him or somebody else, please give me a friend. Because honestly, like as men, I think as men, we're, we're like afraid to be vulnerable. We're afraid to say we need somebody. We're afraid to reach out and be like, that's a cool dude. I want to be around him. But I saw what Rex carried and just being backstage with him right now, I saw two different people come up to him and said, hey, God really used you to heal my back, heal my neck, heal my body. And I saw something on him and I'm like, if I could get as close to that, maybe a little bit will rub off on me. And now I'm here with you and you're my best friend. Thank you so much for bringing me. Seriously. I feel like the way Elisha must have felt when he rolled with Elijah. So if the chariot comes, give me your coat because I want that double portion, all right? Bye, Rex. Bye. I'll keep the rest. And then last but not least, does anybody in here like Colin and Melissa Higginbottom? All right. We're going to do something really cool right now. 
Everybody stand up. I have the privilege of traveling around the country announcing football games. He just said I'm the voice of the Tennessee Titans. I announce Tennessee Titans football games. One of my favorite things to do is announce the starting lineup when they come out. You got the music going. You got people coming out of their stands. For everyone back there drinking beer and peanuts, you can throw them right now. Just get crazy. The smoke. You do the intro. So can we do that? And have, here, For two reasons. One, it's going to be really fun. Let's close this thing out and have some fun. Can we have some fun right now? And two, our photographers and videographers are going to get this. And if you're not jumping and going crazy right now, when this thing hits the press tomorrow, your friends are going to judge you, all right? So make sure you go crazy. Let's hit this music. I'll give you that Tennessee Titans intro. Here we go. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for the champions of change. That's it, I'm done. Have a great day, guys. I'm a huge fan of Seinfeld. George Costanza told me to end on a high note. I am done. No, I'll just be a couple minutes. Honestly, that was, oh my God, wasn't that so much fun? All right, Melissa, seriously. True story. You want me to do it again? We can do it again. You want to do it one more time? Colin's like, can we do that one more time? Should we? All right, everyone rise to your feet. Here we go. Let's hit that music. Okay, now that, now that. Can't fight the crowd. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, introducing the champions of change, the couple of encouragement, the pioneers of Holy smokes. Do it again. Oh my God, I don't ever want this day to end, you guys. Seriously. Thank you, thank you so much. I wanted to honor you guys. Like, I don't take it lightly that you bring me here and put me in front of all of your friends, your family. Like, it's a really, really big honor to be here. So thank you so much. Yes, so about me, true story. I grew up in Covina, California, not too far from here, Covina in the house, all three of us, whoa. Yeah, 626, yeah. Old school, 818, yeah. No, I grew up in Covina, California. I did. It was 818 back in the day. I still remember my phone number growing up. By the way, congratulations. I saw you guys get honored. Seriously, how about that? Dude. Okay. Like your shoes? For real. So I travel around the country and I help nonprofits raise money as their auctioneer. True story. After this, I got to go to an event. Can I see this shoe real quick? Yeah. We're gonna start the bidding out at five hundred dollars. So we're gonna be five hundred. Five hundred now one thousand. One thousand now fifteen. Fifteen now two. Fifteen would it give to you? Two thousand dollars. Once, twice. Sold for five thousand dollars. Wow. Dude. What would make you complete, John, if you wore these? Then you'd be the perfect person. Seriously. That's the only thing missing. All right. Too much. This is way too much fun. This is way too much fun. All right, let's get to the serious stuff, guys. I actually got a good message. Um, grew up in Covina, California. My parents were phenomenal. My dad was an insulator. I learned my work ethic 
from my dad. He's retired now. Dad, if you're watching from the 626, I freaking love you. You're the best. Seriously. Your boy made it. 1.96 GPA didn't matter, did it, Dad? <laughs> really didn't. Which means I must have had an encouraging mother which I did. Honestly, my dad taught me my work ethic, but my mom, my mom's my hero. My mom was my hero. I don't even know why we use the saying man up. We should start saying mom up because moms are the ones that get crap done, right? <laughs> like, let's be honest. And I'm not trying to patronize the ladies. Like, I'm just being honest. We start saying mom up. Like, they're the ones that get it done. But my mom was my hero. I'm 43 years old, so I grew up an 80s baby. She's bumping Def Leppard and Poison in the back. She's got big glasses and really big hair. Like, she made Richard Simmons look like an amateur. Like, it was really, really big. You raised your hand. Did you have some back there? Yeah, amen, sister. And I always, like, make fun of her. I was like, Mom, why is your hair so big? And she'd be like, you know, Matthew, the higher the hair, the closer to Jesus. And I'm like, all right, amen. But... She was awesome, and she, for real, she taught me, she taught me how to love people. She taught me how to love people well, and she taught me how to see value in every single person. One of my favorite memories was, because uh, I'm the baby of five, I was a mama's boy, I am a mama's boy, and she would do a lot of stuff with homeless people, and she, she showed me at a young age, she gave me the opportunity to give my shoes to a homeless man, and wear his shoes. And she said, you know, Matthew, you'll never know what it's like to be in someone else's shoes until you are. And the look that I saw on that guy's face when he smiled, and I'm not trying to make a joke here, true story, like he was homeless and had like two teeth, but his smile, like it changed me. I'm like, I wanna do that for people because I saw my mom do it. And through her generosity, she would bring heaven everywhere she would go. Every day she would drop me off before school. She would say, Matthew, remember who you are, whose you are, and where you're going. So for you note takers, you could write that down. Remember who you are, whose you are, and where you're going. Who you are, I would say, is your identity, which I think, you know, the biggest crisis maybe now is mistaken identity, people that really don't know who they are, which is why you go to the inner cities and kids turn to the streets. They turn to drugs. They turn to gangs because they find their identity in the streets. They don't know who they are. Even in the workplace, people are only as good as it's going. They're only as good as their last deal. They find their validity through their boss and they get stuck in that rat race, that identity, because if I can only make him happy, if I can only please my boss, when they don't even know that their, their boss is already pleased with them. You don't pay such a high price for a piece of junk. Every single person in this place is worth the death of Jesus Christ. There was a big thing, you know, a long time ago, which lives matter? And I like to say, Jesus settled that 2,000 years ago when he died for everybody. You know what I mean? So the identity that people lack is really, really sad. And I'm going to say this. I was praying about it backstage, but God told me I could, so I'm going to say it. Some people find their identity in their ministry and in their serving and in their church. And they're serving, and if, God forbid, if pastor doesn't say hi to him that day, well, then there's something wrong with him. And then they start a little coup of gossip of what's wrong with the church and everything that's going on. And then they get a thing, and they start pointing fingers at everyone, looking at what's wrong, when the truth is, they're like, well, that's just not a very loving church. Well, it should have been loving. You were there. So know who you are. Matt's not funny anymore, is he? He's not the funny guy anymore, is he, Tam? Sorry. <laughs> who you are. Second, know whose you are. And I believe your confidence comes from knowing whose you are. Of course, as a kid, my mom would say, your identity is in Jesus Christ. Knowing that my identity is, is, is in him and I'm seated in heavenly places and I'm in the world, but I'm not of the world, gives me a confidence that even when the world tells me no, the kingdom tells me yes. Sitting backstage, listening to Marco's story. I'm going to touch all about that because we're so similar in what you went through. Going through hell, asking God, this is not what you told me it would be. Having a promise from heaven, but you're walking through problems. 
Living broke when you know you're supposed to be rich. There's a lot of people out there right now that are going through something, and I promise you, if you keep your confidence in knowing whose you are, your future is going to be a lot better than your past. Know whose you are. And last, know where you're going. Going back real quick, because I do want to say this. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it now. Knowing whose you are. Now, as a man, as a married man, I travel a lot without my wife. And I help a lot of people raise money. And when the event's over, a lot of people want to shake my hand. And a lot of people want to give me things. And if I didn't know whose I was, I might be another statistic of infidelity and be a reason why there's a 50% divorce rate in America. So sorry, ladies, this is off limits. <laughs> sorry to break your heart. No, but seriously, how cool would it be, man, if, if men really honored their vows to their wife? Come on. And lastly, know where you're going. Where are you going when you know where you're going? That's your vision. If you don't have a vision, the Bible says you will perish. Knowing where you're going keeps you motivated. It keeps you excited. It gives you a reason to wake up in the morning. Two months ago, I didn't know what was going to go on. And now here I stand in front of you beautiful people. Like this is really, really fun for me. I had a vision when I was young to be a football player and I wasn't very good. I was a freshman at South Hills High School in West Covina. I played one play my freshman year, but I had a vision and I had an encouraging mom like I told you to and she believed in me. My mom was the greatest source of encouragement in my life. She never saw what was wrong with me. She only saw what was right. Kind of sounds a lot like, you know what I mean? And I never felt pressure from my mom. But don't get a mistake, like my mom disciplined me. There's a difference between discipline and pressure, okay? Discipline, I mean, like nowadays, like parents don't know how to discipline their kids. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna say it. We got some family members when they bring the nephews over. You know, yeah. Sorry, Tommy, you stink. You gotta change your diaper. You're not allowed to stand on my $2,000 coffee table with a jelly donut. And I don't care what you identify as, you're a boy. Sorry. <laughs> Discipline. Discipline. There's a difference between discipline and pressure. Pressure makes you feel like you're not good enough. And I never got that from mom, and you will never get that from Jesus. You're always good enough. You're already qualified. It doesn't matter where you're at. Start seeing yourself the way he sees you. Whew, this is so good. Can I take notes for myself? So when I play one play my freshman year, and I was really bad. Um, at the end, this is actually a really crappy story, but I'm gonna tell it because it's rela uh, you know, it goes with the message. So we're all huddled at the end. I think we went like five and five. And the coach said something along the lines of, I'm gonna mess the story up, but it was like, you know, most of you will never go on to play in the NFL. And probably a lot of you won't go on to play college, especially Rogers, because he effing sucks. <laughs> like that really happened. So, so I had an encouraging mom and a not so encouraging coach. So I did what any other freshman boy would do. I quit. I quit. I really did. And back in the day when you quit and you didn't play sports, uh, you went to PE. <laughs> Remember like all the cool kids, the guys that look like John are in sports and the guys that look like me are in PE. <laughs> If I could only get invited to a party at John's house, I swear my life would change. It's where all the hot girls hang out. I love it. I don't know why, like seriously, like I was just, we're here today. I hope that's okay. Um, <laughs> but uh, I had no confidence, I quit. I was in PE and one day, but I still love football. I had the vision of football. One day I was playing flag football and I was running around and the varsity coach who had never seen me before was the substitute teacher. 
Steve Bogan. He is now the head coach at Bonita High School in Laverne, I think. So Coach Bogan, someday if you watch this, you changed my life. I love you. It takes one person, one encouraging word from you to your kids, from you to a coworker. Sally that walks around with her books like this at work and no one ever talks to her. They're waiting for you. Your kids are waiting for you. I was waiting for Coach Bogan. He saw me running around on the field and he said, you have really good feet. And I said, I do? I do. I do have really good feet. And long story short, he said, you come play for me and we'll develop your feet and all this stuff. And I said, okay, first day of practice, I show up, Coach Bogan's there, the freshman coach is there. He said some things, made me feel stupid. Coach Bogan encouraged me. And at the end of the day, freshman coach was wrong because daddy won a freaking Rose Bowl, okay? Let's go. Let's go. Mom was right. Mom was right. Mom up. Mom up. Mom was right took down Drew Brees in the Rose Bowl, 34-24. I was doing a thing with Drew Brees like two years ago for an organization called Feed One where he's the spokesperson. I'm backstage and I take a picture with him. I'm like, hey, bro, you don't have one of these. And he looks at me, he goes, yeah, but mine's bigger. And he held up his Super Bowl ring. (laughs) You're right, Drew. But um, after that, after I won the Rose Bowl, you know, My passion was always football, and I loved making people laugh. Back to my childhood, I loved doing what I'm doing right now. I love making you guys laugh. I I love it. Uh, I love encouraging people. I love making people's day better, which is why I started this brand of Bring Heaven. I want to bring heaven everywhere I go when I walk into a room. And um, after that, after football was over, I tried out for a little show called American Idol. Season three. How many people voted for me on American Idol? Be honest. You're the one. God bless you. Notice my boy Rex didn't raise his hand because he voted for Fantasia. All right, there you go, Rex. It's true. Rex voted for Fantasia. But here's here's the truth. When, When you think about football... Okay, I had fast feet. I wasn't the biggest, I wasn't the strongest, I wasn't the fastest. I had a gift of good feet. And the Bible says your gift will make room for you and bring you in front of great people. So your gift will get you in the door. But your skills will keep you there. You need to work and cultivate your skills. I'm gonna steal a playbook out of my boy Rex when he says, you can't purchase your gift. Your gift doesn't go on sale. It can't be bought. It has to be built. And I had to build my feet. And when I was on American Idol, I'm looking at Jennifer Hudson. I'm looking at Fantasia. For those of you who know Jennifer Hudson, she's probably one of the most amazing singers on the planet. She's doing something right now where she's made Aretha Franklin in a movie. She did Dream Girl. She won a Golden Globe. She won an Oscar. She's absolutely phenomenal. So imagine me backstage looking at her, looking at Fantasia, and I'm like, I can't do that. But what I could do is I could do this. I can entertain people. I can make people laugh. I can bring people in. That's what I can do. I can't win The Voice or American Idol maybe. But I'll tell you this. You want to take me down to the gas lamp district? I can win a freaking karaoke contest, baby. All right? Blame it all on my roots. I showed up in boots. And I'll start swaying like this with my bell buckle. I could do that. Like I can do this. So that's when I got on, like I got on with doing this, making people laugh, you know, like being a decent singer, I'd say I was like a six out of 10, if you know, Fantasia and Jennifer are 10 out of 10 and, but I had fun and people liked it and people voted for me and I get to the top 11 and we're going in country week and they're like, Simon Cowell did a thing with Mario Lopez and Mario asked him, he goes, uh, who do you think is going to be the top two finalists? And Simon says, I think it's going to be Fantasia, and I think it's going to be Matt. And I'm like, dude, let's go. So this is like back in 2004, so Yahoo comes out with the polls, and I was the favorite for country night. And I wanted to sing, because I'm the country guy, I wanted to sing, and by the way, don't laugh at me, 20 years ago, this song was actually relevant. I wanted to sing How Do You Like Me Now by Toby Keith. And I wanted to put the cowboy hat on, because there was like, you know, like, all the people who rejected me as a kid, I saw this vision in my head going like, 
how do you like me now? You know what I mean? Like, and I was gonna do all this stuff and it was gonna be awesome. Notice how I'm talking past tense because it never happened. Because the producer or one producer sat me down and he said, you know, Matt, America wants to see the softer side of you and Josh Grayson did it this way and Ruben Stutter did it this way and Clay Aiken did it this way and he started getting this in my head and I tried to be something I wasn't. And you, please don't do it now, wait till I'm gone, but you can Google my, our YouTube, Matt Rogers final audition and it's gonna look something like this. It's really bad. Let's get really uncomfortable right now. I sat on the stage, instead of rocking it out like I have been, Sat here, crossed my leg in the front. True story. Yep. And I wanted to be like Josh Grayson. And I said, amazed by Lone Star. Every time our eyes meet. And it was terrible. And afterwards, I had all my football players from Washington, because you could bring different people. And uh, <laughs> God bless my football players. And they look at me, I'm like, what'd you guys think? And my buddy goes... Bro, that was some of the gayest I've ever seen in my life. I was like, was it not? You called it before I started doing it. Was it not? Was it not? It was terrible. And you could even YouTube it. Simon Cowell says to me, he goes, Matt, that's not you. He goes, and I think you cost yourself this competition. Let me tell you guys something. What's it gonna cost you when you try to be like somebody else? 8.5 billion people on the planet and none of them have your fingerprints. You were born an original, don't die a copy. Some people have business ideas. Some people are going after a relationship. Some people wanna have another child and people are telling you you can't do it. Doctors are telling you you can't do it. What does God tell you? That still small voice inside of you that burns with passion every time you think about that thing, whatever it is, that's for you. That's your promise. Don't look to somebody else to fulfill your dreams when God's the one that put the desires in your heart. So after American Idol, uh, they were really, really good to me. I'm not gonna talk too much about it, but trust me, and you guys already know this, dude, the same way you treat the janitor should be the same way you treat the CEO. And the producers, they were called PAs, production assistants, the ones who would get, you know, the broccoli and ranch and mac and cheese and all that. A lot of the other people, like, they were mean to them because they thought that they had, like, arrived. But I was always good to those people when I was done. Those are the people who elevated me in the television industry. And the people that used to serve me broccoli and ranch were the same people who hired me for Deadliest Catch and Discovery Channel. You never know who you're standing in front of. You never know who you're standing in front of. In fact, bump the person next to you and say, if you knew who I was, you'd be really nice to me today. Kiss her, Colin, kiss her, kiss her, yeah! Dude, true story, she's backstage watching you on TV doing these, look at. so awesome. And I know my wife's watching, babe, when daddy gets home, we're having another baby. That's facts. That is facts. So after American Idol, they were really, really good to me. And I started hosting television shows. And I was in my third year. I had a show called Really Big Things on Discovery Channel. We would travel around the world and do like the world's largest dump truck. We went to Vegas and did like the big uh, King Da Ka and Cirque du Soleil shows. It's called Really Big Things on the Discovery Channel, not the Playboy Channel. Discovery Channel, Really Big Things. <laughs> really Big Things on the Discovery Channel. I'm going into my third season, 29 years old. 29 years old, third season, and I write my first big contract. It was for about 500 grand to film for four months. It was a dream come true. My gift made room for me, I developed my skills, and I had arrived. This is when life starts. We had our second kid. My wife and I always had a dream and a vision to have four kids. Our first son is born, his name's Braden. He's 15 now, I love that boy to death. 
he would have loved the finance and crypto and political stuff. He, like, dude, the fact that David Harris Jr. is coming here this Saturday, he would freak out. That's him. Um, and then my second son was born. And this is where life gets real because every single person in here can raise our hand and think of the time, and maybe you're going through it right now, where life drops a bomb on you and put something on your plate that you really didn't order off the menu. And for us, it was when the doctor called me. I'll never forget it. I was literally like two days after I signed my contract. And um, he calls me because he goes, hey, Matt. And my wife was in there for the one month checkup. Everything was fine. And he goes, "Uh, I've only seen this two times in my 42 year medical career. He goes, and your son has cystic fibrosis. He said, it's a chronic lung and pancreas disease and there's no cure. And I was just devastated. I mean, like devastated. 29 years old. We had just bought our first house. Life was good. And I said, what does this mean? Is my son going to die? What does this mean? And he wouldn't answer me. I said, is he going to die? He goes, and you know, when they don't answer you, it's not good. So I had to pivot because sometimes life throws things at you that you're not ready for. Hello, COVID. Think of how great things were in January of 2020. (laughs) Right? And then all of a sudden we're in May and we're like, how in the hell did we get here? I mean, every one of us. And that's what I was. And my life went from what it was to breathing treatments morning, noon, and night. My wife, I can't not cry when I talk about it because it's real. My wife went from being the best businesswoman, smart woman, everything she did, and she became a nurse. And she didn't want to be a nurse. She became an in-home nurse, breathing treatments every day, enzymes before every meal, medications, diagnosis. I literally remember walking into the room and the doctor said, you know, he's going to have to be on a feeding tube. And this was right in the beginning of when Rex and I started to become friends. And I had Rex pray on him because my son couldn't even eat a chicken McNugget. He was so small. And this was when it was really, really bad. And uh, we had Rex pray on him. And, and then life just kept going and it got worse and worse and worse. And I remember, and this is what resonated with, with what you said back there, um, what you said back there, Marco, is I'm sitting there and I have this promise from God, but I have this very real problem. And it's living between the promise and the problem that kept me super and totally dependent on God. This is where the difference comes in because everyone in here is successful in some area of your life. And everyone in here knows about God. Everybody watching online knows about God. Everyone in the world knows about God. But there's a difference between knowing about God and actually knowing God. So when you're going through hell, you know that there's a bigger promise. You know, and I would literally ask him questions. Why did you die on a cross for our sickness and our disease only to have my son die? I didn't, and it's real. And which is, it's so important. God, who you surround yourself with is so important. Guys, I had family members write me really, really nice letters that they meant well that would write stuff like, ultimately, Mason's gonna get his healing when he gets to heaven. And someday, God, if it's his will, will heal him. And I remember I just would cry and would cry and would say, that's that's not you. That's not you. That's not what I saw in the life of Jesus. This is not my life. I'm going through this, but this is not my identity. I knew who I was. On top of that, my mom passed away. My biggest sense of encouragement, she dies. And then in 2000, he was born in 2008. In 2009, I lost my house. I lost my cars. I lost everything. I went from making $500,000 in four months to making $50,000 a year driving from Rancho Cucamonga to Santa Ana, California, working a job I hate, underappreciated, a boss that was a jerk to me, not getting paid what I was worth. And I would literally say, what the hell am I doing here? And some of you are in here right now thinking, what am I doing here? Not here, but in life. What am I doing here? Here is where you need to be. If you have never been to a Pathfinder's apprenticeship, now's the time to sign up. Now's the time to change your trajectory and your direction. Because when you get around people who believe, life can change on you like this in an instant. 
And all of a sudden, you wake up because life goes by so fast. And I had to pivot. I had to develop skills to be a better father. I had to develop skills to be a better husband. My wife was depressed, crying at home. She didn't leave the house but one or two times for nine months. This is where richer for poor, sickness and in health, good times and bad times, when you're standing there all young and in love, now this is when it matters. Anybody can say it. And I don't mind when people win the Super Bowl and win the World Series and say, I'd like to thank my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I don't mind that at all, but it didn't cost them anything. But when you can stand at a funeral for a loved one that wasn't supposed to pass away and you can say, I don't understand everything, but you are still the Lord and Savior of my life and it costs you something. That's when heaven opens up and your life can change. And all of a sudden, sitting in the cheap seats in the back, praying for God to bring you that guy on stage and be a friend, praying for God to heal your son, you wake up one morning and all of a sudden you're standing on a stage in front of a group of unbelievable people that didn't know your name 40 minutes ago and now they're writing down the words that you say because you've been through a thing or two. And the man that you prayed for is now your best friend and he's your first phone call everywhere you go. And he hooks you up with unbelievable leaders that you guys actually have access to anytime that you want. The true definition of success is when you do more for others than you do for yourself. And that's what these people solidify. They want you to win more than they want to win. You surround yourself with people like that, your life can change in an instant. You look at your best friend who was there for you from day one, who you cried with on the phone, and sitting next to your best friend is your 13-year-old son who's completely healed from cystic fibrosis. Let's go! Let's go! This ain't no game! The kingdom of heaven ain't no game! These people ain't playing! They want the best for you. Healing, deliverance, forgiveness of sins, you get it all. You are surrounded by churches that want you to pray a prayer to get to heaven, and that's fine. But dude, that's the starting line. That ain't the finish line. Now we gotta do life. Now we gotta take territory. Now we gotta have political leaders that are gonna change the face of our economy and stand up for you. People who have made it to the finish line that say, I don't want to cross yet until you come with me. Sign up for the apprenticeship. Sign up for the class. Come with me. Walk in a life of healing. Walk in a life of success. Walk in a life of freaking winners. I love you. I love you guys so much. It took everything to not cry, but I did it. Seriously, thank you, thank you, thank you for bringing me here. I love you guys. Thank you so much. God bless you.